Ezekiel chapter 38, let's look at the first eight verses. We'll use that as a platform to look at the chapters. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, I will turn thee back, I will put hooks into thy jaws, I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers, with shields, all of them handling swords, Persia and Libya, Ethiopia, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarma of the north quarters, all his bands, and many people with thee, be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, and is gathered, notice, out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, But it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. As we look at this particular battle in Ezekiel 38 and 39, we want to take note, it gets twice the print that the battle of Armageddon gets. As we go through the scripture, there are many battles described in the past, historic. Some of them were described and then took place, they've become history. The present struggle in the Middle East described in many ways, and there are still future battles that are described, and certainly Armageddon being the most famous of all battles. People of all faiths, people that are non-believers, are familiar with the idea of Armageddon and this last and final battle in the history of man. And when we look at these battles, we want to decide where they are, and particularly this one, because it's the only one where a whole chapter is dedicated to the cleanup of the battlefield and so forth. This is the longest description of any particular battle in the Bible. So I think as we look at it, I want to know, we want to look at it and see what what is the timing of this. We know this much about it. It's after chapter 36 and 37. It's after God has spoken to the mountains of Israel and regathered the people of Israel from all of the nations of the world. It's after they have taken a national identity, not a spiritual identity yet. That's at the end of of chapter 39, but certainly a national identity, a nationhood. There is Israel, the nation. That has not existed since 586 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar drove them out of the land. They weren't a nation under Rome. They were a province, but now a nation reborn, a sociological nation miracle in our time. So we know that it's in the timing of that, of what we see in the news today, Israel back in the land. We know in verse 8, it tells us it will be after many days. In fact, it says in the latter years. And for any student of prophecy, that makes your ears perk up a bit. If you look in verse 16, it says, thou shalt come up Please take notice against my people of Israel, God owning them as a cloud to cover the land. It shall come notice in the latter days and I will bring thee against here. It is my land that the heathen, the nations may know me that I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. There isn't a historical battle that we can look at that fulfills this. It says specifically it will be in the latter years, in the latter days. It will be after Israel is back in the land. You can do with that whatever you want to do with it. But that's what this ancient prophet under the anointing of God's spirit says to us 2,500 years ago. That this is what will happen in the latter days. It will happen in the latter years. Some try to say, well, this is a picture of Armageddon. This is, this is the picture of that last great battle. Well, I take some issues with that. I have some problems with it. I'll tell you what they are, and that's my opinion. Study the scripture. Don't believe me. You have a Bible. As you read Revelation chapter 16, heading into the battle of Armageddon, it tells us there that there are sores. 
that break out on the bodies of all of the men on the earth and women that have received the mark of the beast. There's no mention of that here in Ezekiel 38 and 39. It tells us in Revelation 16, leading to the battle of Armageddon, that all of the water of the entire, entire earth, all of the oceans, all of the freshwater, the streams, the lakes, have all been turned to blood. No small detail. No mention of that here. It tells us there in Revelation that the sun is burning the skin of men and they're blaspheming the God of heaven. No mention of that here. It says there in Revelation that the river Euphrates will be dried up, not dammed up, dried up to make way for the king's of the east. No mention of that here. Last year I talked to a group of, or two years ago, a group of Korean pastors were here looking at the church. And I asked them, what do you think about with all the tension with North Korea? They said, well, we hope that a war doesn't start because we feel that we can negotiate and there may be reunification. And we feel strongly there needs to be a consortium of Asian nations to compete with the European Union. We have to see China and Japan, North and South Korea, and some of the Asian nations come together into an economic block so we can compete. Revelation says the river Euphrates will be dried up to make way for the kings of the east. There's no mention of that in Ezekiel 38 and 39. In fact, it says there for the battle of Armageddon that there will be several unclean spirits unchained from the river Euphrates that will go throughout the earth and gather all of the kings of the earth, not just seven nations, all of the kings of the earth to the battle of Armageddon. No mention of Armageddon here, no mention of all of the kings of the earth. Tells us in Revelation, the sun and the moon and the stars will refuse to shine. That's no small detail. Not even mentioned here in Ezekiel. There's no mention, by the way, of the Antichrist. No small detail. No mention um, here of Jerusalem specifically. That's no small detail. There's no mention here of the parousia. Of the heavens, sun, moon, stars not shining. And Messiah. Jesus coming through the heavens, white horse, vesture dipped in blood. Who is this that cometh from Basra? It says, all of the tribes of the earth shall see him and those who pierced him and mourn. There's no detail. They're not even mentioned here. That's no small detail. Most importantly, in some ways, it tells us here in this prophecy, Israel will be dwelling securely, safely. The idea is at rest, in verse 11, at rest from war. That's vastly different than the condition of Israel at the end. That's the time of Jacob's trouble. They're not living peacefully. So it's far from it. So this is a distinct battle. It's distinct from that. And it's given to us in great detail. And it, it, it falls to us to decide where are we in relationship to this? When, when is this going to happen? Some try to say, well, this is the end of the millennium, the kingdom age. Because it says in Revelation chapter 20 that Gog and Magog, that Gog shows up again. Well, the, the problem I have with that is it tells us the cleanup of this battle, that they're going to search for dead bodies for seven months and then hire professionals to go and clean up. And it says they're going to burn or destroy the weaponry for seven years after this battle. Well, we know in Revelation chapter 20, the heavens and the earth flee away. There's no seven months, no seven years. There's nothing left at that point in time. The reason that Gog shows up again in Revelation 20, in my opinion, is because Gog here, the prince of Rush, or the chief prince, is a principality in power, much like the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece that we meet in Daniel chapter 10, who are principalities and powers that rule over world powers. Well, some say, well, there's no prince of Rush. There was never Rush, Rus, anywhere in the, in the history of the Bible. Well, there was never Greece up until it happened. There was never Rome up until it happened. But they were prophesied also and became world powers and have become history since. So the reason that Gog shows up again is this principality and power, this prince of Rush, like the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece, no doubt is bound for a thousand years with Satan and is released out of the bottomless pit again at the end of the thousand years to lead one more rebellion against Christ. But this is certainly not that picture. This falls in front of us now to decide where to place it. Look at the participants. The participants in this battle are Gog of the land of Magog, King James says the chief prince of Meshech, Tubal, prophesy against him, this personage, Gog. Magog just means of the land of Gog. 
The question is, is it the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, or is it the prince of Rush? Kyle and Delich, Hebrew grammarists, say that in this instance, it should be translated the prince of Rush. Uh, whether you do that or whether you say it's the chief prince, it is still some personage, I believe spiritual, because when, when these, this consortium of nations comes, it's, it's not their choice. God puts a hook in their jaw and drags them into the Middle East because he has a plan, and that is to magnify his own name so that the nations will know that he is the Lord God. But he, here we have Mesek, Tubal. What do we do with that? Magog, Jerome tells us, is the, 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 the Scythians. Pliny tells us Magog is the Scythians. Josephus tells us Magog is the Scythians. They're the forerunners of the Russians. They, they, they all tell us that they come from Taurus, from between the Caspian and the Black Sea, north of the Caucasus Mountains. You can trace all of that out for yourself. Byzantine and Arabic writers from a thousand years ago uh, tell us that Rus was a people, R-U-S, that lived in Taurus and reckoned them amongst the Scythians. So however you want to look at this, it tells us in one place they come from the uttermost parts of the north, go home, draw a line north of Jerusalem and see where it goes in the uttermost parts of the north, you find yourself in Russia, in Moscow. Certainly, what other nation in the last days could arm themselves and arm the allies that are here described. Persia, modern-day Iran. Russia has non-aggression treaties signed with the nation of Iran. Iran quietly behind the scenes supporting uh, many of those antagonistic to Israel. Uh, Ethiopia and Libya, not what we think of today as Ethiopia and Libya, but certainly speaking of northern Islamic Africa, broader than just the modern countries of Ethiopia and Libya today, but those whole areas uh, held in front of us. Uh, Gomer, the house of Togarma. Uh, if you look at an old map, you'll see in northern Turkey and over towards the, the Taurus Mountains, Togarma, western Turkey, eastern Armenia today still call themselves the house of Togarma. So no mystery as we look at the area here. And it says that this consortium, this powerful nation in the north, is arming themselves, and they are arming Turkey, Armenia, that area, Iran, and Muslim North Africa to come with them one day into the Middle East. Now, I don't know who else that could be but Russia, my opinion. Ezekiel gives us this prophecy a thousand years before Islam. A thousand years before Islam. When he gives this prophecy, these were just tribes. They were no threat. And just to try to think what could bring unity between the house of Togarma and Meshech and Tubal and Iran and Persia and North Africa, there was no, nothing that brought them into alignment in those days. But of course, Islam has become the glue to pull all of those nations together. I think it's interesting as we look at that picture telling us in the last days, in the last years, when Israel is back in her own land, there will come a group of nations watched over and armed by this, the, 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 the descendants of the Scythians arming Iran, Turkey, North Africa, and they will all converge on Israel like a cloud covers land. It's very interesting to watch what's going on in Turkey today. Turkey has been moderate. In the past, uh, they, they have done business with Israel. They had looked to the West, but the European Union decides not to admit them. Huge mistake. Now, Turkey is predominantly Muslim. And when it came to the beginning of the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, they decided, because the West was pushing them away, rather than allowing us to use their airfields and come into the northern part of Iraq from Turkey, they threw their lot in with the Islamic nations, realizing the West is turning us away and this is going to kill our stock market. And it did, but they thought we have, our purposes will better be served in the long run with this group of nations who at least we will find some fidelity with. 
Interesting to watch what's happening there. As I look at this description, there's some nations that are conspicuous here by their absence. Certainly as I look at this, where is Iraq? Where is Syria? Two major protagonists of Israel for decades. Neither of them mentioned here. That's very interesting. Well, certainly the prophetic landscape has shifted in your lifetime. And you understand now why Iraq is not mentioned. Iraq was the one rattling, rattling the saber. They were the ones who was more vocal. Saddam Hussein was going to drive the Jews into the ocean. He was the one that was going to destroy Israel. Iran was more quiet about what they were doing. Iraq, no longer a threat. Not mentioned here. Very interesting. Syria. People who are in the know say that many of the weapons of mass destruction are stored in Syria. The Israelis know where they are. And the Israelis have given notice. The day you pull them out is the day that Damascus will disappear. I don't know. I know that Isaiah says this in chapter 17. The burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, it shall be a ruinous heap. That has never happened. Damascus is one of the oldest cities in the world. Jeremiah in chapter 49 says, Concerning Damascus, Hamath is confounded in our pad, for they have heard evil tidings. They are faint-hearted. There is sorrow on the sea. It cannot be quiet. Damascus is waxed feeble. She has turned herself to flee. Fear has seized her. Anguish sorrows as a woman in travail. Therefore her young men shall fall in her streets, and all the men of war shall be cut off in that day, says the Lord of hosts. I will kindle a fire in the wall of Damascus, and it shall consume the palaces of Ben-Hadad. There are two passages in the Old Testament to tell us that Damascus is going to be eradicated, burned, destroyed, turned into a ruinous heap in a day. That's never happened. How far away is that on the horizon? I don't know. It's interesting as we look in Ezekiel, Iraq is not mentioned. Syria is not mentioned. Egypt is not mentioned, which has been more modern and has had some treaties with Israel. Jordan, who quietly, constantly works behind the scenes with Israel, not mentioned here. The Saudis, very interesting if we have them at all. It's in verse 13 where it says Sheba and Dedan... The merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, cattle and goods, to take a spoil? So Sheba and Dedan, Saudi Arabia, seem to be standing on the sideline saying, What are you doing? What, what is this? You're coming into this part of the world. What for? Interesting. The ships of Tarshish. Spain, most probably, that area. Some feel even Great Britain. That's, it's hard-pressed to prove that. Um, we know Stone in Stonehenge, there's evidence that even ancient Greece was trading with Great Britain. So it's a possibility. But certainly it represents Europe and trade with that part of the world. Ships of Tarshish, all the young lions thereof. Who is that? I don't know. Canada, the United States, Australia. We don't know for sure. And again, you have to stretch it. But we were looking at that. But the point is... The United States is, is, is absent here. That bothers me a bit. I'm, I'm so egocentric as an American. You know, where are we? And the interesting thing, Israel's dwelling safely, it says at this point in time. Watch this process in Israel now to create a Palestinian state. Not approved of by God, but certainly every nation in the world wants to see it happen. Ariel, Sharon, cooperating, pulling people out of Gaza and the West Bank. I know this. During Persian Gulf One, the Israelis complained to us because they weren't getting information in real time. And Scud missiles were falling on Israel. And it was all we could do to restrain them. In the second conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan, the present president set up by the Knesset a headquarters where the Israelis were given battlefield information in real time. They received it at the same rate that our commanders received it. And Sharon said this president had kept every promise he made to Israel and had been the best friend that Israel had. Now, I believe he understands, because there's, there's so much anti-Semitism in Europe... 
I believe he understands that it is it's better wrongly, but in his mind, he's probably thinking it's better to negotiate something now relative to an administration that favors us rather than waiting until a liberal administration comes to the United States who would rather be friends with Europe and sell us out for the oil money and we'll get nothing at all. It's who would have ever thought Ariel Sharon would have fallen in line with what we see now. It's, it's amazing. It makes me scratch my head. But it may create a pseudo peace. It will never be a peace. There will never be peace till Christ, till the Prince of Peace comes. But it may create a pseudo peace in that part of the world, a false peace, a deception. America, absent, that bothers me. America is the greatest superpower the world has ever seen. You go through Babylon, Greece, Rome, there has never been a mightier military, technologically, with destructive power ever in the history of mankind. And where are we in this battle? If anything, we're sidelined. What happens between today and this that seems like it could be so close to push us to a second or third world status? What will change? Defender of Europe, twice the United States, two world wars. Wasn't it interesting to see Europe decided they came to loggerheads with us over this last war and they decided their interest would best be served, their national interest, in a different direction than ours. That hadn't happened for a century. Europe is in the scripture, comes to the head in the last days. Israel's in the scripture, in the center of everything. We've been the defender of Israel. Where's the United States? What happens to us? Well, it's interesting as I watch the news. At this rate, it could just be another hurricane. <laughs> hey, I hope you filled up yesterday. They're saying by tomorrow, gas might be $5 a gallon. Our whole economy could break. California is rocking and rolling, rumbling. A major quake out there, we could be in a depression. We could be a second world power. Another terrorist act. Not if, probably when. I don't know. Anybody get National Geographic this week? The head article, the avian flu. They talked about the flu that hit the United States in 1918. In 1918, Over 20 million Americans, over 50 million people worldwide died. In fact, in Philadelphia, one-third of the population of Philadelphia died from the flu. 750,000 people lived in Philadelphia in 1918, and in one year, 250,000 of them died from the flu. 3,000 people died on 911. 250,000 people died in a year from a flu. Schools were closed down, churches were closed down, synagogues were closed down, public buildings were closed down. And morgues were backed up, couldn't keep up with the dead bodies. People were coming down with the flu at breakfast, and they were dead at dinner, some of them, in a day. Now they're talking about this new flu. They said 350 million people could die from this flu if it learns to jump from person to person. If it hits Calcutta, if it hits a densely populated, impoverished area, it will cross the world. We think that we're so stable. The truth is, we're in a very precarious place. We're in a very precarious place as a nation. Human life is very fragile. That's the truth. We've taken too many things for granted as Americans. I look at this and I think, Lord, what's going to happen? What will sideline us? I have another suggestion if the Lord's listening. (laughs) Remove all the Christians. Let the Lord descend with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. How many people in the present administration will be gone? What part of our population disappeared? And if that happens, there will be no support in this country for Israel. We look at the trouble we see now. 
Imagine all the believers gone. This country would be left to, to jump in bed with Europe to think that oil money was more important than blood. And it would create this landscape, I think, very quickly. Bring Europe to the fore, precipitate an invasion of the Middle East. And of course, it says in that day, it says 54 times in Ezekiel, they shall know that I am the Lord. God will stand up supernaturally and defend his people. He will destroy the invading armies on the mountains of Israel. Certainly, shaking the entire oil cartel, that will set the stage for the Antichrist, a man of peace, to sign a seven-year treaty with Israel, coming himself with supernatural power, signs and wonders, the great lie, ascribing the things that have taken place to himself, and then ultimately seating himself in a rebuilt temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Very interesting times that we live in. Listen, however right or however wrong I am about particulars, whatever you want to argue about, that's fine. Look, don't listen to me. Study the scripture. You can chase this stuff down. Decide where you think this battle belongs. It's given more detail than any battle in the Bible. It has to be important. It's brought in front of us. And I think it's very distinct from Armageddon. I think it is the thing that could set the stage for Daniel's 70th week. It could be right around the corner. Where does that leave us? How much time is left between now and then? And what do we do with that time? Are we good stewards over that time? It tells us in Ephesians that we should buy up the opportunities that come to us. We should walk circumspectly, knowing the days are evil. That God has chosen us, like Esther, for such a time as this, to live now. Hey, am I a depresso? No. Are you sitting there thinking, oh, man, this is an encouraging sermon. I should have stayed home today. No, 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 no. Look, look. These are just details. If you take a step back and look at it, they say something louder. They say to you and I, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming for his bride to take her and carry her across the threshold into his kingdom. Jesus is going to take his bride home before this happens. Will America be destroyed by a nuclear holocaust? I don't think so. Not with us here. We're the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Two or three American cities get hit by thermonuclear devices. This administration is not going to sit idly by. Syria, Damascus will disappear. Tehran will disappear. North Korea, you know, everything's going to start going up. If God wouldn't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, if there were ten righteous in it, God's not going to let that happen as long as his people are still here in the world. It's going to come. Listen, it's going to come. Revelation chapter 6 tells us what we're seeing now is the restrained version. When the four horsemen ride forth. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. The same warnings are given to us. Take heed that no man deceive you. False Christ, false messiahs will come. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Let not your heart be troubled, for nation must rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes. These things are going to happen. All of that is restrained. When you come to Revelation chapter 6, the church is already in heaven. Jesus opens the seals and allows it to go forth, and, and deceptions no longer restrained. The Antichrist rises forth. War is no longer restrained. The red horse rides forth. The famine is no longer restrained. The black horse rides forth. Pestilence and death no longer restrained. The dapple gray horse rides forth. And it says under those four horsemen, one fourth of the world's population is lost. That's close to two billion people gone in the first half of the tribulation. Listen to me. Those numbers equal this, all of South America, all of Central America, all of Mexico, all of the United States, all of Canada, and all of Western Europe without a single human being alive. It is unimaginable. It is unthinkable. It will come, not while we're here. Not while we're here. Jesus doesn't beat up the bride before the honeymoon. He tells us as husbands, treat your wives the way Christ, Christ treats the church. He nourishes it. He cares for it. Ladies, if you're married to a post-tribulationist, you're in trouble. <laughs> Look, 
I'm not depressed about all of this. My heart is broken. I think of unsafe friends and relatives. What am I going to do with that? Are we taking the time to share the love of God with the people that are around us? To tell them the truth. This generation is truth starved. And the media makes sure of it. We know what the truth is. And we have opportunity to give to every man the reason for the hope that we have in these crazy days. And that is that the Lord is coming. He could come before the band comes up to play the last song. I hope he does. Why don't you guys come up? See if he beats you. <laughs> We're going to have the musicians come up and play this last song. That is our hope. All of these things transpiring around us hark of the return of Christ. But it's trouble for this world. We should be busy about our Father's business. We should occupy till He comes. We should examine where we give ourselves, our resources, our energies. What are we doing? What are we laying up in eternal abodes? What are we using frivolously of our time and our energy here that could be well spent in the direction of eternity? We're in the countdown. Let's stand. Let's pray. If you don't know Christ today, Man, after the service is over, come up. We'd love to pray with you. You need hope in this world. And there isn't any hope without the Lord. Father, I know you've overheard. Thank you for this record. Thank you, Lord, for the great detail. You set these things in front of us. No doubt, Lord, you wouldn't have us mindlessly pass over these things, but examine them to bring them before our hearts. And Lord, whatever we know of exact detail, Lord, we we have no desire to be dogmatic, but certainly our hearts are stirred We look at the world we live in and we believe that you have mapped this out beforehand. You said, I've told you these things so that when you see them, you will know that you're at the very doors. So, Lord, have us, Lord, afresh. We recommit ourselves, Lord. We think of family members, loved ones that are lost, that we haven't taken the time to talk to. That we haven't been open with, Lord. We think of those around us where we could... Take more time to demonstrate your love, to reach out in the name of Christ, and we haven't. Lord, we pray for you to come and set up your throne in Jerusalem. To rule the world, the knowledge of the Lord covering the earth as the waters cover the sea. It's in our hearts, Lord. You put it there. Come quickly, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.